Last week, I mentioned how old enemies in the Middle East are cozying up to each other as they seek to move further away from dependence on the West, the dollar and its payment systems. I shared ECB chief Christine Lagarde's observations about multipolarity and the fact that the world is splitting into two halves. Well, things are moving so fast that I want to go a bit deeper this week because it's starting to look like we in the West could be on the losing side of history. The BRICS group will need to change its name to an alphabet soup if it wants to remain an acronym of all its members' names. This week's brain teaser is to come up with a name that encompasses Afghanistan, Algeria, Argentina, Bahrain, Bangladesh, Belarus, Egypt, Indonesia, <gasps> Iran, Kazakhstan, Mexico, Nicaragua, Nigeria, Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, Senegal, Sudan, Syria, the United Arab Emirates, Thailand, Tunisia, Turkey, Uruguay, Venezuela, and Zimbabwe. Here's my starter for 10. C-R-A-P-P-E-R, -P -P -E crapper. Commodity rich authoritarians providing political and economic repression. Just imagine how powerful BRICS will become if all those Middle Eastern oil producers join in. Already, BRICS nations account for $4.5 trillion of trade, up from just $2.5 trillion in pre-banana syndrome 2019. When they got together in Cape Town last week, there was lots of lobbying from would-be members, while South Africa angered the West by saying that they'd let a certain Mr. V. Putin attend their next meeting with impunity from his international arrest warrant. And if you're not already scared, this next statistic should have you hiding behind the sofa. According to Acorn Macro Consulting, in purchasing power parity terms, the BRICS contribution to global GDP now exceeds that of the G7, which comprises the biggest developed nations in what we still call the West, i.e. America, the UK, Germany, France, Japan, Italy and Canada. The latest IMF forecast up to 2027 suggests that this gap will continue to widen in the BRICS favour. It's partly a result of their larger and faster growing populations. As we've discussed elsewhere, the terrible demographics of the G7 will weigh heavily on future growth prospects. China's ageing population and the legacy of its disastrous one-child policy will be a drag on its growth. But India has no such baggage and now has the fastest growing middle class in the world. Our own middle class is fast disappearing under the weight of inflation, overregulation, and the ever increasing size of the deep state. In the UK, a third of all employees now work for the government, up from a quarter just a generation ago. That's why millions of people are being dragged into higher rate taxes to support this growing army of parasites. The rise in economic power is being accompanied by energetic efforts at de-dollarization. This is accelerating a trend that's been in place for some time. Back in 2001, the dollar share of global reserves was a whopping 73%. That plummeted to 55% by 2021 and dropped further to just 47% a year later. Today, over 70% of trade between Russia and China is settled using the ruble or the yuan. And when Russia trades with India, the transactions are settled in rupees. Kenya has announced that it will buy oil from Saudi Arabia using Kenyan shillings instead of dollars as a result of a new fuel import agreement signed by the Kenyan president William Ruto and the Saudi crown prince Mohammed bin Salman. According to Kenya's president, the agreement will allow the country access to all of its fuel needs in the form of a six-month loan and eliminate $500 million in monthly demand from the market. His words hint at another way in which the traditional Western-led financial system, led by the IMF and the World Bank, is being undermined. 
Russia and China are engaging in under the radar debt forgiveness and bailouts in Africa and Latin America, no doubt in return for locking up supplies of commodities and rare earth minerals. Russia has canceled $20 billion of African debt in recent times, while China has established its own rather opaque system for being a lender of last resort. There's no better example of how much things have changed than that well-known failed state, Sri Lanka. The IMF agreed a four-year, $3 billion lending program to try and get this troubled country back on track. How did China itself, an IMF member, respond? It refused to take part in the IMF process and instead agreed an entirely separate debt forgiveness deal. Who knows what the terms were? I think we can assume that they were designed to be in the best interests of the People's Republic rather than the good old Western rules-based system that's kept the peace since 1945. China has used a combination of liquidity swaps with the Chinese central bank and funding from state-owned banks to bankroll these opaque transactions, which are another way of giving a great big V sign to the West. What concerns me the most is that while the G7 ties itself in knots with talk of the energy transition and net zero, the BRICS nations are cornering the very building blocks of our own standard of living, cheap energy and basic commodities. Do you imagine that China, India or Russia are giving a second thought to opening up new coal-fired power stations in their rush for growth? We seem determined to impoverish ourselves, even though our contribution to global emissions is so small as to be rounding factor compared to these guys. With Germany going ahead with the decommissioning of its last remaining nuclear plants, and Keir Starmer about to announce that Labour would grant no new drilling licenses in the North Sea, the West is clearly increasing its dependence on imported energy. If the oil producers align with Z and Putin, where does that leave us? I never thought I would count on Mr. Bean to back up my arguments, but last week Rowan Atkinson said that he is giving up on electric cars. The environmental cost of creating them is way higher than for a fossil fuel driven car, and the batteries require rare earth minerals that need to come from China and Africa, who are increasingly turning away from trade with the West. Atkinson points out that once a petrol engine car reaches around five years old, it's paid its environmental dues and is on a level with the lifetime impact of an EV. Here in Portugal, a quarter of all cars on the road are more than 25 years old which is far greener than the cavalcade of Teslas lining up outside every private school in the home counties each morning. Today, the BRICS account for 31.5% of global GDP, while the G7 contributes just 30%. Even without all these new members, the BRICS share of the pie was due to reach 50% by the end of this decade. That is certain to happen sooner as crapper reaches full strength. How can we second guess where all this leads? Will these countries demand a stronger presence in the post-World War II institutions like the United Nations, the IMF and the World Bank? How will America react to Mexico's apparent defection? Will the West be prepared to cede political power to the Eastern-led alliance? Some are saying that we're on a slippery slope towards global conflict, while others are predicting a series of regional proxy wars over territories like Taiwan and scarce commodities. While some of these trends have been in place for several years, I can't help feeling that the single biggest catalyst for change has been the election of Joe Biden. His obvious weakness in Afghanistan and his short-sighted weaponizing of the dollar have backfired hugely on the credibility of the West. Whatever you think about Donald Trump, Putin would have thought twice about invading Ukraine when the guy in the White House had literally lifted him off the floor with the strength of his handshake. Putin is a thug who only understands the rule of the mob. 
a playground bully who is more than happy to pick on little Joey Biden. I'm no great fan of Trump, but the Western world desperately needs a strong leader to restore some of the balance of power. We seem to be racing towards a cliff edge, and I fear that the result of the 2024 US election might determine whether we pull back or join the lemmings on a rapid descent into oblivion. I'll see you next time.